Hi, my name is Pete. I work on Dagster, and I'm going to talk to you today about building a poor man's data lake from scratch with DuckDB. So the first question on your mind is probably, what is DuckDB? Actually, you, know, you already know what DuckDB is. It's, it's like so hot right now. Everybody's talking about it. You can think of DuckDB as kind of like a SQL light for analytics. Um, so I think there is a, a couple of reasons why people like DuckDB and why it's so hot right now. Um, it's very feature rich. It's very fast. It runs locally, integrates really nicely with Python and has a bunch of features that make it just really useful. Um, and it's all MIT licensed. I think the bigger reason, uh, though, and the underlying reason that people like it so much is that it's just like a breath of fresh air. It seems like really simple, lightweight, makes sense. Modern data stack in 2022 is super complex, requires a bunch of different components. And DuckDB is just like, you know, just a real breath of fresh air. And, and it's it's simple and it's free. And I think people like it for that reason. So um, we are going to talk about building a data lake on top of DuckDB. And, um, you know, before we do that, um, we should probably talk about why this is even a good idea. I told you a bunch of features that DuckDB has and a bunch of reasons that DuckDB is good. Um, but why should we even embark on this project? Well, um, you know, despite the limits of DuckDB, specifically that it runs on a single machine, uh, when it's combined with a couple of other technologies, like an orchestrator like Dagster, S3, uh, and Parquet files, um, or the Parquet format, uh, you can really build a, um, a data lake that scales pretty highly because there's so many um, high-performance machines available on AWS. So with DuckDB, it runs on a single machine, so... You know, if a single machine can't churn through all the data uh, fast enough, then you can't use it. But the question is, you know, how many organizations are really doing lots of queries that are going to take more than like 2,000 gigs of RAM and 128, uh, you know, CPUs? The answer is there's probably a lot um, that, that do, you know, that scale of data. You know, I've, I've worked at a bunch of those places and there, there's way more than you think. However, there is number one, like, a large class of businesses that don't process that much data. And number two, uh, there are lots of teams within large organizations that want to take advantage of a lot of the benefits of DuckDB and maybe the specific problem they're working on can fit within these constraints. So, um, and when you get to use DuckDB for something like this, you get the same, you know, SQL dialect locally when you're running your tests as, as you would remote. And you don't have to pay licensing fees to some SaaS vendor in order to, to run your queries. Um, and so before we dig into this, like in depth, uh, I just want to highlight that this is like totally experimental. Uh, we're not using it in production. In fact, we're not using any libraries here um, for this specific problem that are tested or anything. We're going to go build this solution from scratch. So think of this as a tutorial to help you learn these technologies and um, potentially uh, kind of sketch out a future architecture for these types of data lakes. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be in data engineering, and, and this is one of the, the really exciting areas that I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up to explore. So the thing we're going to build um, is uh, we're going to take DBT's Jaffel Shop example. This is like a classic example that a lot of data engineers and analytics engineers um, you know, use for, for examples. Um, and we're going to use, uh, we're going to basically plug DuckDB into Dagster, S3, and Parquet. Uh, and we're going to call it Duck Pond. It's going to be like a little mini data lake uh, built on top of these technologies. Now, um, the code is available here on GitHub if you just want to git clone it and see the code. Um, and this blog post is available here. And um, uh, we're going to just get started right now. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new um, Git pod instance. Uh, this is a really cool app that I like. It's it's called Gitpod. It creates a cloud development environment for you uh, with a standard set of like package package versions and stuff. So for tutorials, it's really really convenient. So just go to gitpod.new and it will spin up a container in the cloud for you with an in browser Visual Studio code. Um, so uh, you know you you'll be working in exactly the same tools that I am, and we won't have to you know deal with. Python dependencies or, or anything like that, um, or inconsistencies. So the first thing we're going to do is, is um, we're going to get the project started. So I'm going to type pip install Dagster. And this is going to install the Dagster command line interface. Um, so Dagster is what's called a data orchestrator. It's the thing that combines and coordinates all of your different 
um, tools in your data stack. And so we're going to start with Dagster. Uh, it's convenient because I work there too. But uh, but really, your orchestrator does sit in the, the center of these things. Um, so we're going to start with that. And the next thing we're going to do is scaffold a project. So we'll say Dagster project scaffold. Name is Jaffle. So you can see here, we've got a hello world type of project uh, scaffolded for us. It doesn't really do much. Um, the next thing we need to do is add some dependencies here. Um, so we're going to, because we're building a, um, you know, the poor man's data warehouse, we're going to depend on DuckDB, we're going to depend on pandas, uh, we're going to depend on uh, this library, SQL Escape Pi, uh, which helps us escape, you know, we're going to be generating SQL strings because we're using DuckDB, and so we need a library to help us um, create uh, safe uh, SQL strings. And then finally, for one of our examples, we're going to scrape Wikipedia, um, and so we need these libraries in order to do that. Um, we're also going to add some dev dependencies. There's this really cool library um, or tool called Local Stack. If you're not aware of it, it lets you run a bunch of AWS, um, like mock AWS in services locally. Uh, so we're going to use this to run S3 on our uh, on our local machine or this cloud dev environment. Uh, in order to to set things up, we also need the AWS CLI and the uh, this dialect of it called the AWS CLI local, which points basically the A AWS CLI at local stack. So now that we've saved this, we can pip install. Yeah, you know what? I'm uh, I'll make the font size a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, so, oops, I, I should probably switch to the right directory. So I can I can run pip install dash e, um, and uh, you know this is going to install all of these different um, these different packages. Uh, except I misspelled the SQL escapee. Now let's try that. And so this can take uh, you know a little bit of time. Um, fortunately, the the Git pod environment's got a, a bunch of CPUs and is is in a data center, so it's generally pretty quick. Um, so the next thing we need to do once this finishes installing is we're just going to spin up our local stack environment. Um, so local stack, like I said, it's a set of mock AWS instant uh, AWS services, and it's is really convenient. You just run local stack start, which we installed it as part of that Python installation process. Um, and it runs on, uh, you know, local hosts. And so if, uh, I can go and create my S3 bucket now. So just to give you an idea for um, what this, uh, this architecture kind of looks like, we're going to be running a Dagster app in here. Um, this is going to be like our main, our main project. It's going to run DuckDB from inside of the Dagster app. And it's going to read and write files, uh, parquet file format um, files um, on this this S3 uh, in an S3 bucket. Um, so you can think of these parquet files as tables in a data warehouse. So if you you know, for example, like if you're using Snowflake or BigQuery, each of these parquet files would correspond to a a, a table partition or full table in those those um, systems. And um, you know where BigQuery and Snowflake couple compute and um, and storage. Uh, in this, we separate those. So, so S3 is going to be our storage, and um, DuckDB is going to be our compute. I also want to note that um, you know there's a lot of um, generic S3 implementations. So you know you don't have to actually be tied to any vendor using this this architecture. Um, all these tools are completely open source, and S3 is a generic API. So you can you can use DigitalOcean Spaces or MinIO um, as your as your storage layer here. Um, so with that, we're going to go and create our um, our S3 bucket here. So we've got the S3 service running, and so we run AWS local S3 make bucket S3 colon slash slash data lake. So the name of our bucket is going to be called data lake, and so um, that means um, cryptically uh, that it worked. I think you'll just have to trust me on that. Um, and let's go in and start uh, writing some code here. So, like I said, the core kind of abstraction here is going to be 
S3 files, um, or, or sorry, Parquet files sitting on S3, and we're going to interact with them through SQL. So I'm going to first want to create like a little abstraction for representing SQL statements because we're going to be doing a lot with SQL. Um, so I'm going to create a file here called duckpond.py. I'm going to create a little class um, to represent a SQL statement. Um, so this is kind of just a, a, a data class. And um, you can basically think of this as representing a statement, the SQL statement with placeholder. So you might want to say like select star from my table. My table would be a binding um, that's past this constructor and the SQL uh, would be this template string. So you would kind of construct it like this, you know, my table equals. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll show you, I'll show you that implementation in a bit. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so um, with this little abstraction, we're going to start actually building um, uh, an example application. So I told you that we were going to go do the Jaffle shop example, but we're actually going to start with something really, really simple, something that reads um, a couple of, of uh, data sets from Wikipedia and then computes some basic statistics on them. So I'm going to start, um, I'm going to just copy and paste some code in here. Uh, we're going to use uh, Dagster software defined assets to model each of those parquet files or, or tables in our database. So we'll start with um, a population asset. What this does is reads um, the UN list of countries by population uh, from Wikipedia, uses the pandas read HTML um, function to do that. Um, then because you know they they use a weird unicode dash to to show you know negative numbers we replace that um, and then we return a sql statement that selects you know all the columns from that data frame and uh and and you know returns the result um, i'm also going to add a second asset that is based on the first asset so this is country population And you can see over here, um, we run a query. We say select the continent um, and then the average population change um, from this population uh, asset, which is kind of referred to up here. And then we group by the continent and then we order it in descending order in terms of, you know, highest population change to lowest. Um, so, uh, you know, this is um, this is hopefully pretty straightforward. You know, you should go check out Dagster Software Defined Assets if it's not clear how this works. But you know, basically, this decorator plus the name of this this parameter tells Dagster to kind of set up a dependency between these two assets. Um, so so you get that that kind of SQL object um, from the previous uh, the previous asset. Um, so the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to um, write a test case. So that we're doing a little bit of test driven development here. Um, obviously, we haven't implemented anything yet um, that, that actually talks to DuckDB. But let's just write a test so we kind of know where we're going here. So let's open up test assets within the Jaffle tests package and we'll save this. And so basically what we're going to do is um, we're going to call those two assets that we um, that we talked about. Um, and we will basically assert that we get that SQL statement back and then we'll actually run the query um, and then we'll assert that, um, you know, this continent is the top one and that the, the population change is the known kind of expected uh, population change. Um, so, you know, um, this, this test, by the way, uh, it does call this population asset um, directly, which does go to the network. So in a real kind of production application, we would mock that out. Uh, but for the purposes of this tutorial, we're just going to leave that in. Um, you'll also notice that we import this, this fictional, um, so far, uh, DuckDB class. We instantiate an instance of DuckDB. We call query. We pass it that SQL object, which represents the SQL statement. Um, and then we get a data frame. Uh, so we should probably go and implement that um, that DuckDB class. So I'm going to go back here into Duck Pond, and I'm going to um, copy and paste my implementation of the DuckDB class, and we'll take it step by step here. Um, so I think I should probably pull this up here. Um, 
So uh, we import the connect function from DuckDB. If you've ever used SQLite from um, Python, you know, it's, it's, it tries to mimic that API. Um, and, uh, oops, that's not right. There we go. Um, so this basically is, a, it, you know, it's got a constructor. You can pass in custom DuckDB options, um, which we'll use during this tutorial. We create an, an in-memory or temporary database. Uh, we load what's called the HTTPFS extension. Um, this lets DuckDB talk directly to S3. So this is actually really important. If you have a Parquet file sitting on S3 or on any kind of HTTP server, DuckDB is smart enough to only scan the parts of the Parquet file that it needs in order to fulfill a query. So this means that if you have a giant Parquet data set sitting on, on um, S3, you don't necessarily have to download the whole thing in order to fulfill all the queries. Maybe it only downloads um, certain row groups or certain columns that it needs to fulfill the query. So um, this, this, is, this is a really great feature of DuckDB. When you combine that with the fact that it's got like really great parallelism, you can do a lot with this architecture. And HTTP, HTTPFS is key to that. So we set that up. We also, you know, enable any options that are passed into DuckDB for us. And then um, we are going to do a couple of things. First, um, we're going to collect all the pandas data frames that are referenced by the SQL um, objects that were passed in. So if you, if you recall, we go back to our assets. We actually pass in a pandas data frame um, as a as a binding here to the SQL statement. So we need a way to tell DuckDB to query that. Um, this is one of the magic tricks that DuckDB does, by the way. Not every SQL engine can just query a data frame that's just sitting in memory in your Python process. So one of the, the great advantages of DuckDB is that the, the interop between Python and SQL is, is great. And so um, we, we basically have to, have to write a function that, that kind of collects all the data frames referenced in the query and then we call this function db.register, which is a DuckDB function that says, you know, register this data frame uh, as a SQL view. And then you can query against that view. Um, and then finally, we're going to run our, um, you know, the provided SQL statement um, because it has placeholders in it, like the dollar sign placeholders. We need a function that kind of like replaces those placeholders with actual valid SQL. And we'll write that function in a second. Um, and then finally, we return a data frame as a result, um, you know, from uh, from DuckDB. And um, by the way, it's worth noting that the the you know, according to the documentation of DuckDB, the queries against um, in memory data frames are actually like fairly efficient. Um, I, I don't believe data is copied, um, or if it is, it's it's done you know fairly efficiently. So um, it's it's just really cool. Um, so the first thing, we'll, one of these functions we, we're going to implement is the SQL to string function. Um, we, we, we actually have to implement both collect data frames and SQL to string. We'll start with SQL to string. And so I'm just going to copy and paste this implementation in here. Um, and I'll just pull these imports up here. Um, so warning, by the way, this is, um, those, uh, we're going to be writing some recursive functions here. So, um, they can, they can be a little mind bending. Um, but, uh, but I'll try to, I'll try to walk you through it. So, um, we basically need to take a SQL object that has basically a string with placeholders in it and then a bunch of bindings. And those bindings can refer to either data frames primitive Python values, like a, if you want to put a string in your query, for example, um, or it can refer to other instances of the SQL object. So if you want to embed like one query in another one, um, like for example, in here, right, in this first asset, we pass in a data frame. In this second asset, we actually pass in a SQL object, which references kind of this one. Um, so we need to be able to turn that into a SQL string that DuckDB actually understands because DuckDB doesn't understand these placeholders. Um, so uh, what we do is we, we iterate through all the bindings. If we find a data frame, we reference um, a, the view that was, that was going to be registered. So we, we create a name. So 
df underscore and the ID of the data frame. So every Python object has a unique ID number associated with it. You can call this ID function and get it. Um, so this just, you know, replaces it with df underscore one, two, three, four, five, um, which is going to be the name of the SQL view that's registered with DuckDB. Um, if we pass in, um, you know, an instance of, um, of a, you know, a string or an int or float or any other kind of primitive Python type, we just basically convert that to a string here and we use the SQL escape function, um, you know, in order to safely escape, you know, strings. Uh, and, you know, the, the most interesting case here is if we pass in another SQL object, we recursively call this function. Um, and, and, and so we can kind of like, you know, substitute uh, in, you know, a valid SQL string for that. Finally, in order to do the actual string substitution, we use this built-in Python string template um, class. And um, that's the thing that basically takes those dollar sign placeholders and can interpolate them. Um, so you can look up the Python documentation for this thing. Um, it's not that commonly used, but it's in the standard library and it's, it fulfills our purpose. So um, the next thing we're going to do, uh, so we've already implemented this. The last thing we need to do um, to make this class work is to implement this collect data frames function. Um, so I'm going to go uh, do that. Whoops. Um, we just need that type definition. And then I think I can just paste this in here. And so the collect data frames function, like I said, it goes from a SQL object and returns a mapping of the view name to the data frame. Uh, so if you remember correctly, like, or, or if you remember from before, we created these like view names here, df underscore and then the ID. Um, so we need to basically have a function that walks through all of our, our different nested SQL statements and um, and collect all the all the data frames that are used in these queries so that DuckDB can know about them. Um, so uh, we again iterate through all the bindings. Uh, if we see a data frame, we register it here in the return value. Um, if we see a SQL instance, uh, we recursively enter that and we walk that for all the data frames and we merge that into our return value. And if we see anything else, like a primitive value, like a string or an integer, we don't need to do anything. Um, I know that that was kind of like a, like a whirlwind tour of these kind of complex recursive functions, but um, it is, uh, if, if we've done everything correctly, uh, this should hopefully work. So I'm gonna go into my project here. I'm gonna run pytest, the name of my, um, my package, and we'll see if it works. Hey, the test passed. That's great. Um, it's always good practice, though, when you're writing some code uh, or writing tests to try to break your test, make sure that you actually tested something. Um, so I just changed this expected value to one instead of two. And take a look at that. It, it, uh, it broke. Um, so that's, uh, that's working. Um, so the... The thing that you might find a little interesting, though, is we have this working with DuckDB, but we haven't really brought in Parquet or S3 or any of the stuff that makes this a data lake yet. So in order for us to do that, um, we need to implement something called an I.O. manager. You can look up the documentation for Dagster I.O. managers, um, but basically what an I.O. manager does is it manages passing return values from one asset into another asset. So in when you're running in a test, for example, like if, we, if I pop over to this test, you can see that we just call the function and then pass that value in um, into the other asset. Um, that's great for tests, really, really fast, really easy to test. Uh, but in, in, a, in a real kind of production environment, you're going to want to write this to some storage um, and then read this from, a, from storage when you want to actually run this second step. So you don't have to rerun all these different steps of your pipeline every single time. And potentially you can parallelize them if multiple steps depend on the same piece of data. Um, so Dagster provides IO managers, which, um, which is the abstraction to do this. And you basically say you register an IO manager with your app um, and then it will handle 
you know, uh, serializing and deserializing data from storage um, and, and, and reading and writing that to that storage uh, for you. Um, this keeps your business logic super, super clean um, and lets you kind of transparently swap out your I.O., um, which can be useful in different environments. Um, so let's um, let's go create this. Um, the first thing we need to do is is import um, the base class for I.O. managers, which is called I.O. manager. And then we need to implement the I.O. manager. So I've just copied and pasted that in here. Um, you can see that when we create an I.O. manager, we basically pass it the name of our S3 bucket. We pass it an instance of DuckDB. And then we pass it an optional prefix to basically prefix the names of our Parquet files that we're going to create. Um, this is not the whole implementation. This is the first kind of step. And I'm going to you know, go through the implementation of this class step by step. Um, what we need to do is uh, basically determine the name of the file or the URL of the, the file on S3 for a given asset. So said another way, we've got this asset called population and it returns some data. Where on S3 do we store that data? Um, so in order to do that, uh, you know, we get this, we can get this context object and I'll show you where that comes from in a second that represents the current asset. And we can call, you know, get asset identifier, um, and that will get us a string representing the asset. And we just construct a little uh, parquet file URL here from the S3 bucket name, any prefix provided by the user, and then that ID that um, corresponds to the asset. Now, um, by default, that ID is just going to be the name population. Um, but, uh, you know, there are more complex Dagster features where you can add time-based partitioning, for example, and that will make the um, the URL include that information. So um, the next thing we need to do is handle writing to that storage. So how do we go from that return value to a file sitting on, um, on S3? I will show you how. Let me just copy and paste this in. Um, so This handle output function uh, or handle output method, this actually comes from the, the base class of, of IO manager. And basically given a, a context which represents the asset, um, and then this the what I'm calling select statement, but this is just the return value from the asset, basically says write it to storage somewhere. Um, so uh, I'll just walk through this step by step. Um, if we uh, are returning none from our asset. So, you know, sometimes you've just got an asset that just, you know, during debugging, you're just logging something. We don't need to store anything there. So we just return, uh, we do nothing there. Um, if, uh, if we, otherwise, if we're not receiving an instance of the SQL, um, we throw an exception. So this duck pond system with this particular IO manager, it expects every asset to return a SQL object. Um, so a, a SQL, you know, the, those objects that take the SQL template string and then a set of bindings, it expects those to be returned. If you're returning anything else, you should be using a different I.O. manager. Um, and then finally, we just run a simple query. We call query on our DuckDB instance. And this is the magic incantation to save something um, to S3 with uh, DuckDB. Like, look at how simple that is. Uh, I just say, copy this table to this URL in the Parquet format. And by the way, the, the default here is to, to use um, the Parquet format with snappy compression, but you can provide Z standard or, or gzip or no compression as an argument here. Um, this is all provided by the HTTPFS um, plugin that we had installed earlier. But um, but how easy is this? This is so, this is so great. And um, this is all the code that we need in order to write to our data lake. Uh, we're combining the great features of DuckDB, which are itself built on the great features of Parquet, um, and the great abstractions provided by Dagster to, to just make this incredibly simple. Um, and the, uh, the read path is, um, in my opinion, even simpler. So just like we have a, um, a handle output function or, or method, we have a load input method. Um, which basically takes, you know, a context for the asset that's trying to load a parameter. Um, and then it, uh, you know, returns the value of that asset. And so we create a new SQL object with, um, you know, this template string. And there's this read parquet file 
in, in DuckDB that, you know, again, talks to HTTPFS and does all of that magic around, you know, only reading the parts of the file that it needs to with HTTP range requests. And um, all we do is just pass it the URL to the file that we saved to up here. So you can see here the URL that we wrote to is the same as the URL we're reading from. Um, and so I think one thing that makes this really cool is in our tests, you know, we just pass those values directly into the function. Um, we don't have to go through any sort of I.O. process, which makes your, your test really fast. Um, but then in production, you know, we, we kind of rewrite the SQL a little bit, um, totally transparent to the user, um, and you get the exact same semantics, um, uh, but you, uh, but you, you get a, a big scalable data warehouse, which is really cool, um, or at least a reasonably scalable data warehouse. Um, so now, we, uh, before we're able to kind of run this whole thing end to end, um, we need to actually connect this IO manager to our project. Um, and actually, I think we have to get our indentation right. Um, yeah, so so we have to connect our data warehouse, our IO manager to our data um, or, or to our project. Uh, so for example, we need to figure out, you know, what is our bucket name? How do we get an instance of DuckDB? Do we want to provide a prefix, etc.? So we're going to head on over to this repository.py um, file. Um, repository is is kind of what Dagster calls a project, um, and uh, we're just going to you know, add a couple of lines of code here. Um, it's actually probably the most lines of code in this whole project, but um, hopefully they're they're pretty straightforward. No uh, no crazy recursion in here. Um, first, I need to add a couple of imports right here, um, and then uh, I'm going to add what's called a DuckDB resource. So a resource in, in Dagster, basically like a connection to some external service. And in this case, it's a connection. Um, it's connecting our in-memory DuckDB to the remote like um, S3 instance. So it's providing the credentials to S3, the URL, uh, the bucket name, etc. So um, what we're doing here, or I guess not the bucket name, but we'll do that later. But uh, it, it provides the access keys and stuff. Um, so you can see here, we define a resource called DuckDB. It takes a cons config schema called vars. This is basically just this, the, the variables that we're going to set inside of DuckDB in order to kind of configure the HTTPFS plugin to talk to S3. Um, local stack uses an access key ID and secret called test. Um, we point it at our local host 4566. Um, that's, that's where local stack is running. And just because of the way that S3 URLs are constructed and how SSL works and how DNS works, we need to set these two variables to be, you know, to disable SSL and to use the path style rather than the subdomain style. Um, that's not like super important, but basically like with S3, you know, you'd have to configure a bunch of DNS in order to, to make it work otherwise. Um, so calling this dot configured method takes this resource and basically applies a configuration to it. So now we have a now we have a new resource called DuckDB local stack, and um, and we're going to use that resource in a second. The next thing we need to do is um, just like we brought in and added um, DuckDB uh, connected to local host or to local stack to our project, we also have to connect our um, our IO manager that we wrote to our project. Um, so, you know, you should just kind of read the documentation for how this works, but we define an IO manager, which instantiates the class that represents our IO manager. We pass in the name of our S3 bucket, which is called data lake. You know, you could potentially provide this via runtime config if you wanted to. Um, we say that this IO manager requires a resource called DuckDB. Um, and then we pass that DuckDB resource, which is an instance of the DuckDB connection, um, to our DuckPond IO manager. And as you can see, the second argument here is expecting a DuckDB instance, and that's that's how you get it. So, you know, when you say, hey, I would like this resource, please, 
you know, this is how you access that resource. This key is the same as this key. Um, now, finally, it's time to actually um, put all the pieces together. So I just need to add, um, uh, I just need to, you know, add one or two more imports, um, which is a function called with resources. And then I, um, I just need to say uh, that I want to apply the DuckDB, um, I, the, the DuckDB instance and our DuckPond IO manager to all of the assets in my project. Um, so what I basically did was I took, you know, I took the load assets from package module, which loads all the assets um, in our project. And then with resources says, hey, you know, anytime you want to use an IO manager, use the duck pond IO manager instead of the default one. Um, and uh, we also provide a resource called DuckDB, which points out our local stack version of DuckDB. And then th and this this resource is used and passed in um, to this IO manager. So that's that's kind of a lot of typing, but um, and a lot of keys for things. Um, and I know that that can be a little annoying when you first type it, but there's a lot of advantages here. Like if you have a really complex project and you want some of your assets to be stored in one data lake, and you want some other assets stored in another data lake. So for example, like you want to put some in the US, some in Europe, or you know, some in your own data center with like MinIO or something. Um, this Daxter provides the flexibility for you to do that in a really elegant way by only you know, providing these resources to the proper, um, to the, to the proper set of assets. All right, so I think if we've done everything correctly, uh, we have um, you know created our example application. We've wired up our IO manager. Let's actually try running this thing you know for real, like in production. So I just ran the command um, daggit. This is um, basically a uh, a user interface for Dagster. And if I go over here. Um, all right, so I just had a quick problem with Gitpod, but um, I found a solution for it. You can just run GP URL 3000, and this prints out the URL that you can use to access that port on your uh, on your instance. And so you can see here, this is Dagster UI, uh, and I've got two assets, the population asset and the continent population asset. And I can smash this materialize all button, and it launches a run. And now we have Dagster basically running that computation for us. So we fetch the data from Wikipedia, parse it with pandas. Then we um, use DuckDB to query that data frame and then take the results and store it as a Parquet file on S3. Then we have the derived data, this um, country, continent population, you know, run a query against that data sitting on S3 using HTTP range queries efficiently. Um, and then using you know massive parallelism where appropriate, uh, and then uh, taking those query results and then storing those on S3 as well, and so we can pop over and take a look at this data actually. Um, so I can run AWS local, which is our AWS CLI pointed at um, at a local stack, and I can just say you know um, what is in my data lake bucket. And you can see we've got those two Parquet files. And if we want to actually take a look at those Parquet files, um, I'm going to actually need to install a, uh, a quick dependency here to do it. Um, uh, this this PyArrow dependency is going to just be used right now to, to view these files. I can download that file. I can say AWS local S3 copy data lake continent population dot uh, Okay. Uh, comment. Population .parquet. And so you can see now I've got that continent population .parquet file sitting there. Um, and if I uh, run, I can use uh, pandas to, to read it. So I can say import pandas as pd print pd read parquet. I matched up my parentheses appropriately. 
yeah, you can see that we've got our, our data right here uh, created from our Dagster job. So I want to just recap what we saw. We've just built in a fairly short amount of time with not that much, not that many lines of code, um, a, a, a pretty useful data lake that lets you kind of compose together different SQL queries and efficiently query data sitting, you know, on, um, on S3 and Parquet um, and orchestrate all of that with, with Dagster and write tests against it efficiently. Uh, this can, you know, very easily grow to more complex apps. And if you kind of continue through the blog post, um, we'll implement a more complex one um, called the Jaffle Shop example. Um, I'm not going to take you through all of the details here, but you can see here in this blog post, we basically take the patterns that we walk through here and we expand it out to something that resembles a, um, an e-commerce store. And so, um, as you can see, you know, rather than reading from, reading from Wikipedia, we read from a, a, an example da data set that's a CSV file. We do some additional pandas transformations. Um, and then our SQL queries are a bit bigger and a bit more complex. Um, but it's basically all the same stuff uh, that I showed you in, in that example. Uh, maybe one little addition in this final example is that, you know, we, that resource, that DuckDB resource that we pass in, um, we actually use that to, to kind of query directly at the end so we can materialize our query results and inspect them. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, this has been a, um, a really interesting exploration for us. Uh, Sandy and I have had a lot of great discussions about it, and even members of our community have uh, come up upon similar ideas. Uh, so with that, um, I want to just leave you with, with um, you know, uh, a thank you for, for sticking to the end. I know this was a bit of a long video, um, and, uh, but I hope you, had, you learned something about these technologies, and hopefully you can take some of the ideas here and, and, um, and really play with them and, and build something great. Uh, thank you again, and uh, have a good one.